Well, welcome to our uh, webinar today about suicide awareness. This is such an important topic right now. I'm glad you all are joining in and we are recording it. So if you wanna share this with somebody later, you're welcome to do that. But um, right now, people are stressed and they are under a great deal of pressure. And so what may normally be one pressure, maybe an economic pressure, maybe a marital pressure, maybe an addiction pressure or depression or all these things. Right now, these are all heightened. And so we at Wellspring feel like it's very urgent that we put some information out about this topic. Uh, first of all, that it's urgent, but then more importantly, how we can be aware of people and how we can help uh, protect them from themselves and from these hard times. How can we come alongside and help? So I'm going to just dive right into this. We're going to speak for, uh, I'll talk about 30 minutes, maybe up to 45, depending on how much Q&A we have together with each of you. But we're going to dive in to this. And at the end, we will have a Q&A time. So uh, just kind of put your notes in as you go. And when we stop off and on, we will have that opportunity to share. And at the very end, I will have some resources for you. And you can just freeze that screen and take down any information you need for your life to follow up on this talk. So uh, moving on, what are the goals of this presentation? So first of all, uh, we just want to talk about the prevalence and definitions of suicidal behavior. Then we want to talk about the risk factors, signs, symptoms, what we can watch for in terms of people's behavior, uh, some common misperceptions that we have. And then most importantly is the point D, which is the ways to provide support. How can we come alongside and help people? And then some resources to help you do that. So let's start with the definitions of prevalent and prevalence. So um, it, it may seem funny to say we need to define what suicide is, but we actually do need to define it. So suicide is when people direct violence at themselves with the intent to end their lives and they die because of their actions. Now that's somewhat self-evident, you know that, but I wanna put these other definitions up because it's important. So suicide attempt is a potentially self-injurious behavior that may be fatal or not fatal, but where there's evidence of some intent to die. And I think that's important because I think sometimes people say, well, they didn't really mean it or they weren't really attempting because they did it so, quote, poorly. They didn't, they didn't really make a, a fatal blow to themselves in some way. And we want to broaden that and talk about an attempt is that you have some intent to die. Maybe you're ambivalent. Maybe, maybe it's, it's um, just partial or you're trying and somebody's trying it out, if you will. But the key is that we need to take those attempts as serious and not dismiss, oh, it wasn't a real attempt. Any intent to die, even if it's ambivalent, is a, an attempt. Uh, suicidal ideation means you're thinking about it. And that's with or without a specific plan. So you can think about it and anybody who's thinking about it is of concern to all of us. And then we have a term I wanna remove from our vocabulary, which is suicidal gesture. That's an example of an imprecise uh, dismissive label. And it kind of says, oh, they didn't really mean it. It's a little bit um, diminishing. It says maybe they were being manipulative. And so somebody makes a gesture as a cry for help. If somebody is making a gesture to cry for help, they need help because normal people who are healthy and doing really well with their mental health do not make these gestures. And so I, I want to broaden again our awareness and our sensitivity to people and not to dismiss these things when we think they're, quote, not really meaning it. Let's just take a few minutes and talk about the prevalence. It, it is prevalent. A million people die a year. Um, from suicide, that's in the World Health Organization, that's beyond America. Um, in 2017, the last year we have a solid statistic on this, 47,000 people died from suicide. And when you think about the amount of effort we have spent as a country to, pre to prevent the 80 plus thousand that we're up to with COVID, um, this is half of that every single year in, in America. And so we've got to get more urgent and more proactive in suicide as something that we as a nation need to be uh, addressing. The mental health needs of our people need to be addressed. It's the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. Um, and for teenagers, it's the second leading cause of death. Uh, for teen, uh, 
15 to 24 is the second leading cause of death for them. Obviously, they have fewer health issues, but it just shows you how common this is. There's one death in, by suicide in the United States every 12 minutes. That's an astounding uh, thought that while we're having this program, there will be two people uh, on an average who are taking their lives by suicide. By the way, I'm saying that phrase, taking their lives by suicide, because it's important that we change some of our language and we no longer want to call it a uh, committed suicide because the word committed sounds like a crime and it is a death. It is a sad thing and a tragedy, but we really want to say instead of they committed suicide, they took their life by suicide. So I'll try to do that. It's, it's been uh, an effort to change my own vocabulary, but maybe we could all work on that. Um, there's been a, an increase in suicide, and I think it's important for us to realize that it has significantly increased. There are some other statistics, uh, an increase of 5% in the last uh, 10 years, and so different stats on that. But the point is uh, more people are having these mental health issues and, and taking their lives by suicide. Uh, for every um, attempts, um, there for every 25 attempts there are there's one suicide i want you to notice this next stat here though that in the elderly uh for every four attempts there's one fatality the elderly when they make this decision um they they are more successful at it um they mean it and they so we really especially in this time of so much isolation my own mother is in an assisted living facility and is isolated uh can't have meals with people all those things so right now we need to be very aware of our elderly uh when they feel this discouraged uh and hopeless they can um really succeed at their suicidal attempts, which is terrible. Another statistic that we want to be aware of is how many people are living with uh, as suicide survivors. So uh, the, a tragedy of suicide is not just the person who died. It's all of the other people around them. It's all the survivors who are left with, I, I would have, should have, could have, what could I have done differently? How could I have stopped them? You know, giving themselves a hard time for that. And I want to say some statements of sympathy right here, because although we're doing a, a webinar on how to help prevent suicide, uh, we need to know that we we cannot prevent all suicide. And when those things happen and we didn't see it coming and we didn't know what to do, that we need to give ourselves some room to forgive and to move on because um, surviving suicide is a very hard thing. And so I, I, as much as we're saying, let's figure out how to prevent it, that's us trying to take a proactive future action, but it's not a judgment on those who quote, could have prevented it. And so I, I just wanna make that caveat here at the very beginning. Uh, the prevalence, again, um, you kind of see a lot of it, but this gives you an idea here of how many, um, the, the firearms is a big issue. And I, personally, I, I wish we didn't have so many firearms because it just makes, and I'm somebody who's ambivalent, it makes the decision permanent very quickly quickly. And so uh, firearms are definitely the highest one. Now I've added this extra stat here that I got just a couple of days ago um, from Medscape Psychiatry, a group of researchers in this realm have, and we've all been seeing all these predictions of the future of COVID. Well, this is a prediction of suicide increases based on unemployment rates, based on past statistics. And they came up with this number, it's, it's an interesting number, but 780 more deaths by suicide for every 1% increase in unemployment. And I feel like this is why this is urgent. Um, that's a lot of people. So if we've had a 10% increase in unemployment, that's 7,800. So when we think about, okay, we're at 83,000 in deaths by COVID, where you just added a potentially 7,800 deaths by suicide. By the way, I don't have it on here, but we also, the, the same um, statisticians have said that they, there's an increase of 1,000 deaths by overdose for every 1% increase in unemployment also. So that's a pretty profound uh, stat, because now you're adding, if you have 10 percent of unemployment increase, that's an extra 10,000 deaths by overdose. And um, so we don't count those in here as suicide, but uh, uh, this, is, this is an urgent need for us to be addressing, just like COVID. Um, let's go through a little bit of information on this. Men are more likely to die by suicide. Uh, in the statistics for teenagers, um, females attempt many more times than males, um, like 25 to 4, but 
of the when the males do attempt they are more successful so it's kind of an interesting rate here you can also see that our our asians have the highest um our, excuse me our american indians have the highest number of suicides um our um and white men that the white men are are um discouraged and i see as we face financial crisis in this country that relates to them i believe but suicide hits all ages so uh, you've heard oh it's young people or it's older people it's not take a look at this bar graph it's a little of everybody uh there does seem to be a spike there sort of a midlife crisis um but you know in that 40s and 50s but it's all ages so um, I want to take just one moment and I want to ask you to just on the side of your paper right now, I'm going to just have a moment of quiet. I would like you to ask yourself how many people you know. Now I could make this a poll, but I, uh, yeah, let's try it. I'm playing with my new toy. Let's just do it. All right, take a minute and tell us how many people you know who have died by suicide. I'll give you a second to do that when it looks like most of you have voted. All right, maybe a couple of you aren't voting. I'm just going to end this poll and let you guys see what I'm seeing here. So here you go. Um, share results. All right. So um, most of you know more than from one to five people. That's a, that's a lot. That's a lot of people. I know my husband began counting some years ago and he says he's up to um, 13 men that he has known who've died in the last eight years by suicide. It's a, a terrible thing. Let me close that out. All right, so let's just keep moving. We know it's, it's prevalent. We know we, we need to be working on this. All right, so let's talk about some of the risk factors and signs. How can we, we can't predict, we really can never predict other people. And I, by the way, I want you to know some people give no signs. Some people are very good at hiding, especially if they're depressed, especially if they're very uh, committed to this. So we need to, again, give permission to ourselves to not have read the minds of other people. But having said that, let's look at what we could notice and could respond to. So first of all, um, risk, one risk factor is a prior suicide attempt. This is why I said earlier, um, when someone makes a gesture, when somebody makes a superficial attempt, we really need to per pay attention to them because as you can see, um, the prior suicide attempt increases the likelihood of a future uh, real, real um, suicide. Depression and other mental health disorders, it seems sort of obvious, um, but it isn't necessarily true. It is a risk factor to have distorted thinking um, from some sort of mental health issue, particularly depression, because depression means you feel hopeless and you are depressed. And so that obviously goes together with suicide. But it doesn't mean that those who are depressed or have mental health disorders will commit suicide. And nor does it mean the other, that normal, healthy people cannot also commit suicide. It isn't just people with mental health issues going on. Uh, obviously, a risk factor is substance abuse disorder. That's because when you're under the influence, you have less impulse control. And so they can go hand in hand. A family history of mental health or substance abuse. Uh, there are a lot of factors that go into this family history issue. But if you're living in chaos, if you're living with disorder, if you're living with mental health issues or substance abuse issues, your life may be more chaotic and you may be much more impulsive or um, more likely to say, um, I, I can't keep up with this, I can't keep living this way. Um, a family history of suicide, I don't know, uh, they haven't proven a genetic link to this, but there is a genetic link perhaps to substance abuse, to depression um, and so there is some correlation there a history of trauma and violence or abuse this is really important this relates to people having post-traumatic stress disorder this relates to them having um and as a result perhaps more escalated reactions to things they may be triggered by current stressors especially like right now that are really the history of old things but that puts them in a much more uh reactionary state volatile state and less clear thinking all right, a risk factor is having a gun in the house. Honest, honestly, 
people, uh, the guns are just too easy. If we don't have the guns, we may have to work harder at it. And so having a gun in the house can make it, uh, quote, easier for someone to take their life by suicide. Um, being in prison or jail, it's just depressing to be in jail. There is a much higher risk of suicide in, in prison. Uh, number nine, being exposed to other suicidal behavior, such as a family member, a peer, or a media fi figure. The uh, 13 Reasons, you know, um, show had an absolute spike in teen suicides. And that shows you that this media exposure, uh, where you, they, they had to change the show because they were teaching teens how to do this successfully. It was a, it was a terrible thing, and they tried to correct what they could on it. But... Um, and they also didn't show the helpers as being helpful. So we were, we professionals were very upset about that show. Um, but being exposed to others. So if someone is known, like you have a teenager and they've known four other teens who've killed themselves, they, they have a higher propensity to do it. Uh, we worked with a, a youth at, at our bounce program who said, whose father had died by suicide. And she said, I think that's what will happen to me too. So this correlation of I'm like him in personality and so maybe I'll do the same or my parents did or somebody else in my family did, maybe it runs in the family. Uh, that kind of thinking can actually be a risk factor. Medical illness, um, this is just an issue of people actually saying, I don't wanna face what's in front of me or my life has no hope or I, I cannot see how I could live like this or through this. And so it's a risk. Recent loss or a stressful event. This one's important, particularly with younger people. Um, and by the way, we are going to have a preventing teen suicide coming up in the future, um, a whole webinar on just teens. But uh, for teenagers, this is an issue because if they've had something bad happen, they had a boyfriend break up with them, they had some major loss, because they don't have enough life experience to know that you can have bad things happen and you'll get over it, that you could love again. You don't know that when you're young. You think this is the end of the world. And that you don't have that opportunity to say, I, I got over this before, this will come again, this will come and this will go. But um, so for teens, it's because they really can't see that future. They don't have any resilience experience. But for others, sometimes they just can't picture themselves in a life without this loss or in a life um, this this hard and so those become risk factors and I do think that those are risk factors that are increasing now with COVID because um, a recent loss or stressful event we have people in those both of those roles right now social isolation and loneliness again during COVID we have these things happening people are isolated and so it's a risk factor um, that they're alone and so nobody would care might be the belief system that goes with that all right, let's move past risk factors to actual warning signs. So um, as you kind of begin to think about people you might be worried about. So here are some of the warning signs that you should really take note of. This means you need to be taking uh, uh, extra steps to have some caring conversations with these people. So first of all, talking about suicide direct or implied. Um, people start talking about it, they, they're, it's in their mind. They have ideation about it. They are... Hmm. And they're, what they're doing is they're beginning to say, what if, could I, how would people respond if, you know, um, I might as well just kill myself or you'd be better off without me or some of these kind of statements that are implied, you know, I better get my, my money in order so you can inherit it. Again, that might be an implied thing. Um, but any of those should be red flags to us. Um, so, uh, preoccupation with death. Now, this may be, maybe with young, it might be drawing it and lots of uh, dark figures and, and death figurines and skulls and those kinds of things. But it can also just be kind of a fascination. Uh, kids, you might notice uh, ch children saying, so what happens after you die? And, and how do you know you get to heaven? And how do you know about this? And is there a hell? And, or what? you know, do people remember things after they die or any kind of just a preoccupation with death is a, is a warning sign that they're wondering what would matter if I weren't here anymore. Uh, no hope for the future. So watch the talking of people when they, you know, oh, it's hopeless. It'll never end. COVID will never end. I'll never get out. I'll never get another job. Um, no one will ever love me again. Um, I can't do anything right. Any of those things, which moves us into self-loathing and self-hatred. 
Again, when you hear somebody regularly saying about themselves, loathing things, I'm worthless, I can't do anything, nobody wants me, I have nothing to contribute. We need to be worried about those people, both for depression as well as suicide. Um, later, people may begin to withdraw completely. There's like a shutting down, it's a part of the depression, it's a shutting down, or it's a detaching from people because they're going to be detached. So they begin to, to separate. And so you want to watch that people who suddenly don't want to call family members who don't stop calling. They're not around. They, they don't ever answer calls. They don't join family gatherings. Um, you need to be calling them and saying, how are you doing? You know, we've noticed your absence. Um, Self-destructive behavior, again, so maybe it's not, maybe it's cutting, maybe it's driving really fast, driving without your seatbelt, drinking and driving, um, just playing really hard in dangerous ways is, is also a, a sign of this. Seeking out lethal means, they're busy trying to find a gun and they're, they're looking at ways of driving fast on racetracks or whatever it is that, that might be a way that, that they could uh, end their lives. Um, getting their affairs in order, that's a last stage you want to watch out for, but if they're trying to make sure all, everything's neat and orderly, I think this is particularly true of our older people, uh, um, our elderly and our late stage in life people who are getting things in order for their children, and it just seems like, why are you so busy making funeral plans and wills and all of those things? Um, and then that sudden sense of calm does sometimes happen when the pre people are getting their affairs in order, and then they suddenly calm down. Uh, we think, oh, they're doing better, but they may have just decided, made a solid decision, so we should be careful of that. All right, again, I'm going to give you just a moment um, I'm, um, and ask you to ask yourself, do you currently know anyone um, who you are worried about? And I'd like you to take a moment and write that name or those names on a piece of paper, because I've just given you a list, a couple of lists, risk factors, and warning signs. And I'm hoping and praying that God will bring to your mind somebody that you're supposed to be responsive to. So uh, write those down. And then after this program, I want you to do something about it. So take a moment. Okay, I want to move into something that isn't in the literature very much. It's just my own little uh, paradigms about why. Um, and I think when people have killed themselves, so many of us uh, would say, why would they do that? Didn't they love their family? Um, why, why would they do that? And, and so we, we muse on this. And I think there are some, some answers and the answers will help us in the prevention of this. So one of the reasons why, it's a broad category of three of them, but one of the reasons why is that they have unclear thinking. So that may be a mental illness, it may be depression, it may be a psychosis, it may be that they are coming off of a ventilator and their mind is not clear um, from COVID. We have actually seen some reports in, on that, that the, um, the medications and everything can make people have unclear thinking. We know there's often depression after a um, heart surgery. So just having unclear thinking, substance abuse, all these ways, our minds aren't clear. And so we're not able to think logically or the future, or what about my family and what would the effect be? There's just um, maybe, or obsessive compulsive thinking. So maybe the thinking is, this is it, this is it, this is a repeated, you know, they'd be better off without me, obsessive thought, anything like that. So the truth is some people, die by suicide because they're off their medication, because they've been on medication that causes changes, because they have mental illness, substance abuse. And we need to recognize and take care of those people when they're not thinking clearly as best we can. And forgive them if they've left us for these reasons because they weren't thinking clearly. Um, I think these are important things. A second broad category besides not thinking clearly is they may be thinking relatively clearly, but they have a belief that their circumstances are unbearable. Um, they may have had a major failure. This is some of our, our you know, white men in their midlife who say, I thought I'd succeed at my business, so now my family's better off with, the, with my insurance money. Or they, can't, they get exposed from an affair, they get exposed from 
things that they've done that are shameful and they can't face them. Um, maybe the circumstances are ongoing abuse. So in homes with domestic violence, I can't take this anymore. And this is true for young people who are trapped. And this is happening right now in America. We have young people, and especially young adults, who are trapped back in their home. Their colleges have closed down and they're in a home, but that home is dysfunctional. That home is abusive. That home is not safe. And they can't get out. They can't get away. And we really need to be attending to them. Um, the unbearable circumstances I mentioned earlier, maybe the loss after uh, life after a loss or trauma, they cannot picture themselves in the future after these events. Um, and those are actually the stages of grief. The last stage of processing the grief is to begin to picture your life after this loss or after this trauma. I can live again, I can survive, I can be happy again, I could marry again, I could have life again. And that's a last stage of the processing of loss and trauma, which it's, if it's a major issue, that may be a year later and they just can't hit that last piece of, I can live again, I can be happy again. And so we need to step in and help those people and say, you can live again and, and mom, it's okay if you remarry, the kids will adjust to it or whatever that is that we help people pass that unbearable circumstance. Um, and then again, terminal illness can feel unbearable to people. Uh, the third broad category and it's rel is similar, but it's not that I can't bear the present. It's just that I have no future. Uh, this is our elderly population sometimes. I have chronic pain. I have isolation that I can never fix or the circumstances I'm in are hopeless. Again, how do we help people who are thinking these things and they may not have a mental illness issue, they may just think the future has no hope. And this is where the gospel comes in. This is where God comes in. He has plans for us. If we're still alive, he still has hope for us. He still has plans for our lives and for us to be able to talk to and listen to the people um, about these things. All right, I wanna hit a few misconceptions and then we're gonna get in a little bit more to how we can respond. So let's hit a few of these misconceptions. One is just a myth that people who talk about suicide won't do it. Oh, they're just all talk to get attention. That's not really true. The statistics show that actually people do talk about it and they do intend it um, that I think, I just, I didn't write down my stat, but I think four out of five teens, that was it, um, gave warning signs before they died by suicide. So people do talk about it. We need to listen. Um, thinking that all people are crazy is not crazy. They may just be hopeless and that's their view and they don't realize there is hope in the gospel or in other people or that people would love them or they could have a future. Um, it's a myth that if people are determined to it that you can't stop them. Now there's a little truth to that. Uh, that's why we put people in hospitals because we can't physically prevent things if someone is really determined. But the point on this is that people are usually very ambivalent. And so our intervention, our love, our care for them may be what, what grabs them out of it. Most people aren't just happy to die. They just don't think they can live. And when they have us in their lives and they have us responding, then they may choose to want to live. People are ambivalent. So, so um, be aware that they, they are ambivalent. They want to have a reason to live. Um, People who die by suicide are unwilling to seek help. That's not true. Statistically, it's not true. At least half of the people did try to seek help and for whatever reason did not do enough, didn't stick with it, that kind of thing. Um, and then here's another myth. Talking about suicide can give them idea. We often think of that about young people. I don't want to talk about it. I'm worried about my kid, but I don't want to talk to them about it because they've got the idea. They get the ideas all by themselves. Talking about them demystifies it and it takes it out of the realm of secrets. Secrets really bind us. They're a problem for us. So we want it out of the realm of secrets and into um, a conversation with someone who cares about them. Um, Along these lines, I just want to say, uh, depression is huge in our in our society. Um, half of the people who evidently have depression, according to NAMI, um, our National Alliance of Mental Illness, that's NAMI, um, actually never get treatment. But of those who do, 80 to 90% of those who get treatment for depression are, are successful at improving. So that's an encouraging piece of hope. So let's talk about hope. All right. Hope, we have things we can do and let's make sure we do them. I have four things I'm gonna cover here, which are your tips for hope. How am I doing on my time? I'm doing pretty well. Um, so let's talk about the first thing you can do. And the first tip number one is to speak up. Um, we 
I, I know people often talk about worrying about, the whole family talks about worrying about one person in the family, but nobody talks to the family member. So the first thing you need to do is actually speak up. So the worst thing that happens is that they tell you, I'm fine, no, 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 it's just this, or I'm worried about that, or I'm withdrawing because of something else, you know, and so you feel relieved and they feel cared about, and that's a pretty small risk. Um, and if we normalize talking about suicide, we've kind of begun to say to them, um, this is something that lots of people may think of in a fleeting way, but if you ever did, we're gonna be here for you. And that may even prevent the future. Like your family members may know, you know, they do me. I, they, you know, if I talk about it, mom's gonna take it really seriously. And um, so we don't allow in our family people to say, oh, I'm just, well, except my husband, he, he jokes sometimes, but um, you know, they don't, we don't allow people to just say, oh, I should kill myself or something because uh, we need to jump red flag when somebody says that so that that's not allowed in our house. So that if it ever were said, we all know we need to respond. But by talking about it in the family system or with people, we've actually improved things. So what are the do's of speaking up? Be yourself. So don't try to be a therapist. Don't try to be something other than you are. Just talk about how you feel. I feel concerned about you. I worry about you. I'm afraid to leave you alone. I don't know what's happening with you. I feel cut off from you. Um, these are just you talking about how you feel about their, your concern about them. It's not you trying to change them or fix them or therapize them. It's just you talking about your care and love and concern and why you're concerned. Uh, secondly, do listen. So I'm worried about you. Talk to me about what's happening in your heart and mind. You're just opening the window for conversation and giving, and then being quiet, being quiet. Um, be sympathetic. So you may, um, if this is someone you love, your whole inside may say, um, I want to argue with you. If you tell me I'm suicidal and the, and the inclination, because that makes us afraid, is to say, well, you can't be, there's too much to live for. Don't you know this? Aren't you grateful? Look how you'll affect me. And so we may just kind of come in, a, in an attack mode of people because we're affected by their, that potential loss of them. So listening and letting it be okay that they feel it and that you'll come to a solution is better. Um, so be sympathetic. I can see why you would feel discouraged right now. I can see why it would seem hopeless, but it isn't. You know, I, I understand that it looks like life, life can't go on, but, and then you have those things. So sympathy, offering hope, but depression is treatable, but you can get help, but I'll go with you. Uh, offering hope, a life changes, you know, tell, you can tell a story about how you went through hard times and then it got better. Um, and then take the person seriously at any age. Um, they don't count it as suicide if it's under five years old. Isn't, that's an amazing thing. But it, there are actually very little children who, who have died by suicide. And we need to take them seriously. Um, all right, don't argue. Now that, again, that's the temptation is to argue and tell them why their life is worth living. Uh, listen instead to why they think it's not. And then eventually you can get around to saying, uh, I appreciate your view, but let me let me tell you how I see your life. Let me tell you how important you are to me. Let me tell you um, why I think you're valuable. Um, acting shocked. Uh, try not to act shocked. So it is shocking. Um, this is particularly true, I think, for parents when they're kid uh, says that they're suicidal and the parents are shocked and they, they come across that way. Um, so go be shocked with your spouse later, but in the moment, fake it into, well, everybody thinks about these things sometimes, but I'm okay and you're going to be okay. And we're going to come alongside of you because that shock that, um, can actually shut them down so they don't want to tell you again. And you really want to keep those channels open. So try to fake it when you're shocked and just listen, you know, that's a good time to just kind of close your mouth and say, well, tell me, tell me what you're thinking and inside you're dying. Um, but go to your own therapist later and, and handle it um, that way. Um, don't promise confidentiality. Uh, you can't keep that. We as therapists can't keep it. You can't keep it. If they tell you they're suicidal and you may need to get them to get help, they'll say, I'm going to tell you this, but don't tell anyone. And you need to say, I can't make that promise. Because later they'll say you betrayed them. So just say, I can't make that promise. I just can't. Um, offer ways to fix the problem. You can't fix it for them. They actually have to find a will to live, but you can tell them why you think they're valuable, why you think there's hope and how you'll come alongside of them. 
Uh, lastly, don't blame yourself. You know, someone is feeling suicidal. Don't say, well, it's because I'm a bad parent, you know, and, and that is a common one. It's like, oh, you, my kid is suicidal. So instead of thinking about them, we're just thinking about how we've been bad parents and how we failed. And it, it's just not helpful at the moment. You, again, go get your own therapist on that later and find a place to process those, those bad feelings. All right, let's go to the second category of tip, um, which is... Uh, offer help and oh, respond quickly in a crisis. Sorry. So I'm going to give you some actual just formulas right here. You might want to jot these down, although you can go back to this later. But these are four things you want to ask if you are really concerned in the moment. Do they have a plan? Do they have a means? Do they have a time frame? And do they have an intention? And these may seem like awkward questions, but I, I had to ask these questions just last week. I had a, a, a former client from many years ago, a family member call me and I, I talked to the former client and, said, I, and I very quickly was like, oh my goodness, do you have a suicidal plan? It's a direct question, but you need to ask, are you thinking about this? And do you have a plan? And the second is, if they say yes, you go to question two, which is do they have a means? Uh, if you, here's your question, do you, if you were to die by suicide, if you were to take your life, how would you do it? And ask that question. They will tell you that I would, I would drive off a bridge, I would hang myself, I would shoot myself. And so you need to know, do they have a car? Do they have a bridge nearby? Um, do they have a gun? And so that's, you really need to find that out right away. And then ask them directly. They're like, yeah, I've been thinking about it. Um, I would do it this way. I have a means. And so you need to ask, do you have a, is there a time you think you would do it? Again, it feels kind of like an invasive question, but it's like a fact. And they're like, well, sometime when everybody's gone, or I, I don't know when or whatever, but you need to ask that question because that's how you know what the, cri the level of crisis you're in at that moment. And then and do you intend to take your own life? Just ask them, ask them flat out and let them have to say no to you or I'm not sure or whatever. So the responding quickly in a crisis, if those things happen, if you get yeses to those questions, you need to call 911. You need to call 911 and you think that's a terrible thing to do to this person you care about, but you need to do it because you can't um, prevent them. Now, if you could take a step back and say, look, I, I would like to go with you to the hospital. So if you can get them to go voluntarily, you have helped them not have the experience of having a 911 police coming to their house, asking them these questions and you're telling the answers with them. They're gonna put them in handcuffs, which is a bad experience. But they, it's important because the, the police can't guarantee someone wouldn't hurt themselves in the back of the car, so they handcuff them. But it's a, they, again, it makes them feel like a criminal. Here they are depressed and you're treating them like a criminal. But these are the hard things that we have to do. So you can get that person to the hospital yourself. You drive them there straight to the emergency room and you sit with them until they have an interview. You can do that, um, but you can't leave them alone and you can't uh, delay. So I, that's uh, respond quickly in a crisis if these questions are answered in a, the affirmative. The third tip is to offer help and support. So um, if you have someone you're really worried about, you're gonna be worried. And um, so the key is to get more people involved, get a professional involved, get other family members involved, a pastor involved. You need to uh, create a team which is gonna help this person. And they will probably resist. I don't want a team, I don't want all this, but what you're saying to them is you matter so much, we're gonna all come around you. We all care, we're gonna get engaged. And again, they'll, they'll be resistant, but there's a, a powerful message that's happening here in this uh, group of professional help that they're gonna get. Um, so this, the next thing in getting help is to follow up on treatment. So if someone's really depressed, they may not make that call to the doctor's office. They may not go. They may need you to call that, okay, I'm going to call tomorrow, and so I'm going to go tomorrow. And then you need to go with them, or you need to make the appointment and call in and say, how did the appointment go? What's next? When's your next appointment? Did they give you medication? Are you taking it? Follow up. Whatever treatment they get, they need family members and friends to come around side of them and checking on them because it's not in their... They're, not, they're discouraged, so they're not likely to do it. And so without that kind of engagement, be proactive. You're, once you're engaged and you're in a loop with somebody on this, I'm sorry, but you're stuck. <laughs> you're stuck helping those people. God has called you to this person's life for this time. So go ahead and be proactive, um, checking on them, sending them notes, sending them scriptures, check, seeing how the last thing went that they're doing. Um, 
Encourage positive lifestyle changes. If you can be a part of those, that's great. But um, getting a, a teenager in a youth group at their church, um, going for walks or exercise, and you're going to go with them if they can't do it, and, and um, helping them, you know, hey, let's clean up and take a shower so we can go somewhere, which hopefully we can do soon. Um, all those kinds of things. Making safety plans. Who would you call if you felt this way again? And and let's write all those name down, names down on a sheet of paper. And who would you do and where would you go and, and that kind of thing. Um, support also includes removing the potential means. I don't care if somebody tells you, I'll never do it. You need to remove their means from your house or from their access. Um, there's a gun in the house. We had a, a bounce youth who had taken a parent who was a first responders gun. And the parent had no idea that this youth had that gun in his room. Um, and so just, you know, we need to be aware of our weapons and our things uh, when someone's in crisis and you just tell them why. I don't, I wouldn't lie about it. I'd tell them the truth. I'm just worried. I would never want you to have the temptation. So I'm removing it. Um, continue support over the long haul. Again, just support, follow up, support and follow up. Tip number four and it's my last tip and then we'll move to some Q and A here. Be present without judgment. Whoops. Um, don't be a detective. Okay, so <laughs> this is tempting, again, mostly for parents, but of everybody. So when we say, oh, you're less, well, what did you think about it? Da, 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 and why do you feel that way? And what happened before? We're, we don't need to be a detective. We need to listen way more than we talk. Just give them an opportunity to share what they're really thinking about and feeling about. Um, avoid the blame, should have, could have, you know, well, you wouldn't be so depressed if you had taken your medication or you wouldn't be feeling this way if you'd listened to me earlier. Um, you know, there may be all sorts of things they could have done or should have done or that others could have or should have done. It really is, it's, it's irrelevant. It doesn't help. And it just creates more shame and more withdrawal. So being present without judgment. Um, avoiding simple simplistic explanations. Oh, you're fine. You have more than all the other people I know. Um, you know, you have a lot to be grateful for. Um, just kind of being simple, like just these pat answers. Life is good. You should know it. At least you're an American. At least this. All, all those things are not helpful. Uh, if someone's feeling that way, whether we think it's rational or not, um, we need to let them feel that way and then help them work their way out of feeling that way. We can't really talk them out of it very easily. Um, allow and normalize grief and loss. It may be that what this is about is something they lost. They are grieving the loss of their business, the loss of their dreams for their life, the loss of their loved one, the loss of a, a boyfriend, the loss of life as they know it. Um, and so saying this isn't about suicide, this is just about grief. And so let me help you figure out how to grieve what you've lost so you can continue to live again. And, getting them in for professional help and um, getting them to Wellspring to do the restore retreat where they work the circle on, on how they feel um, and they grieve those traumas, those losses. And so reframing it for them, this is a process of grief you're in. So give yourself permission to be there instead of needing to just end. It, this will pass. Uh, the feelings will come and they will go away if, if we attend to them. Listen with your heart. Just the best thing you can do is be you. Um, we say that healing is equals great, feeling great pain in the presence of great love. So if you can be the presence of great love with God in you, present with them, then you give them an opportunity to feel all their pain and that's what will bring healing. Be patient, uh, respect the unique grief of suicide. Uh, it's it's uh, the grief that my life itself is not worth living. And how profound is that grief for anyone to feel like their life isn't, isn't worth living. So we want to respect that grief and give them an opportunity to, to grieve over it and yet not, not end it. We are at uh, time for question and answers. And um, I want to have a little note here to tell you that we are having a similar, I'm doing a similar webinar, but I'll have one of my other therapists with me coming up. If you subscribe, and I think we'll take all your emails if you're new to us and make sure you're on our subscriber list. That'll come out next week if you want to see a program on this that's specific to teenagers. But I'm going to open it up for Q&A right now. So let me uh, see. I'm opening and see if anybody has any questions that you would like to share as I'm kind of wrapping this up. While you're 
doing, I'm giving you an opportunity to do that. I am going to go to this next slide and, um, and leave this on the screen while we do our question and answer. So I want you to know that um, there are resources and sources. So sources are things I've used for the stats here and you're welcome to look at those. The resources are places you can send people to or yourself to, um, to talk to people, the lifeline supports. Um, there's a lot of, uh, there's just a lot of information out there about how to help people, about getting help yourself. I wanna say that, um, um, all right, so yeah, so find that. So I'm saying that there's a comment, but I don't see it. <laughs> All right. Well, I've gotten a couple. Oh, I see a couple of good comments. That's great. Thank you guys for doing that. Um, we got some positive responses coming in. Um, I don't see any more open questions. And so I, I just want to thank you guys who are a part of this show. It means you care about people. Some of you are leaders. Some of you are all sorts of people who are available uh, for people in your community. If you are personally thinking, having suicidal thoughts, please, please call Wellspring, please uh, get help in any way and from anyone that you think is a good resource to get it. Uh, here's the comment I'm gonna read from um, a pastor says, this pandemic has increased depression and mental illnesses, which is why churches, especially in Florida, who have been classified as essential should open up. Our churches open with sanitizers and social distance. Fellowship and gathering in the body of Christ brings connection. So we just want to thank you for that. I am so glad that our, our pastors and churches are opening up, but even if we're not open, uh, I know all of our churches are available um, by phone and in so many other ways. Um, that people can come and they can get help. But how great is it that we have uh, pastors concerned about this, tuning in and looking for ways to help their congregants to get through these difficult times. I am gonna wrap us up um, and I'm just gonna thank you all for joining us and I'm going to close in prayer. Father, I just, this is such an important topic and um, people are hurting. And so I just ask that you would bless this program. I pray that you would um, take this recording and bring it into the lives of people who need to be there for somebody else and in the lives of people who are feeling so discouraged themselves that they would consider taking their own lives. Lord, we ask that you would anoint this show and that you would save people from uh, suicide and from their sins and from lives that are miserable. Lord, that you would bring hope and joy and healing to many um, through these, these pieces of information. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you guys very much. I hope you have a really great day. Bye-bye.